Thank you very much. If I, I, if I may, I'd like to actually exercise alumnus prerogative and say something a bit about Williams that I kind of mentioned to some folks yesterday. Um, so when I was, uh, you know, I was sitting on a mountaintop in the Himalayas uh, like around almost 20 years ago, and I got a call saying I'd got a scholarship to come to Williams. And I was about to become an engineer at IIT in the sort of Malonian tradition, but instead I, uh, I you know, this is a big opportunity. So my, my parents called a distant relative who served on the Williams faculty. He said, yeah, send him to Williams, he'll become an economist, and make sure he gets a car. So, you know, due to the inspiration of many of the people in this room, I, I did become an economist, and I really, really wish I had a car when I was here. So, um, it's a really honor to be speaking to the C CDE Distinguished Fellows here today as well. I mean, so, you know, I, I, I got to know some of you, your, <laughs> your predecessors back many years ago, and it's, you know, I, I know how, how wonderful you actually, well, I'm sure you are. Um, so... <laughs> So this is, uh, you know, it's also kind of nice to be talking about this uh, paper um, about, you know, in, in this context. I mean, you might think that a title um, called Unfinished Business is going to be Tempting Fate and Referees, especially for a book project. But uh, it's also kind of relevant because it's sort of some of these ideas came out of a paper I wrote for Roger Bolton's um, Urban Economics class many years ago. So, uh, thanks a lot for that extension, Roger. I hope to have something for you <laughs> at some point. Um, so... <laughs> On February 27, 2002, a, a railway carriage carrying Hindu activists caught fire in the town of Godra in the western Indian state of Gujarat. 58 people were burnt alive that day, and in a, the month and a half that followed, more than 1,000 people were killed in Hindu-Muslim violence throughout the state, and 98,000 were forced into refugee camps. Many of them have yet to return to their homes. Now, if you look at the patterns of attempted violence, basically violent, isolated incidences of violence, these are these red crosses, and the actual numbers of violent, like days of rioting that happened in this period, you can see that there were actually attempted violent riots in a number of different places throughout the country. But you know, there's a massive concentration in a single state right here. And in fact, if you look at even closer, you can see that a lot of these, you know, these riots follow the road routes and they just stop at the state border. And if someone asks, you know, was the state actually, you know, did, did the state government seem to matter <laughs> in this context? It seems that this seems, to me, at least, prima facie evidence that it did. If you know, a town just across the border in Rajasthan or in Haryana did not experience the violence at all. But inside Gujarat, it did. Um, of course, Narendra Modi, who uh, was the chief minister at the time, is now the prime minister of India. Now, and a big debate that's going on in the country is whether he was you know, complicit in the ethnic violence or a friend to development or possibly both. This is, I, I love this picture because it, this is a Ratan Tata, who is, of course, a major industrialist. They're, they're getting into the first Tata nano car. It literally looks like they're going on honeymoon together. So, <laughs> so you know, it's a, so, so it's, there's a kind of a big, interesting issue here about you know, what Modi has in mind, especially now that he controls the central government, but also, you know, what, what, what was the role of the state and what are the incentives for different polit political groups in Gujarat back in 2002. So inside Gujarat, it's, a, it's a, like a 400 square mile, no, it's less than that, 400 square kilometer <laughs> box, essentially. It fits, but it's incredibly diverse. This is like the land of Gandhi. It's a land of, you know, a, 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 a long tradition of nonviolence in many ways. But it's also a land which has, a, unfortunately, a long tradition of violence as well. In fact, Ahmedabad, which is one of the major cities there, spent, it's around 13% Muslim, experienced more than 24 days of rioting in that month and a half period. You know, this is a period when the government's imposing curfews, and they're still rioting anyway. This left more than 324 people dead, including in the old city precincts. Surat, which is not very far south, which was once a med the major Mughal, Mughal medieval trading route to, uh, to, to the Middle East, was, is, had roughly the similar ethnic composition. It experienced only six days of rioting. I mean, only is, of course, a relative term. That's, of course, a tragedy in and of itself. More than nine people died, including but mostly in the new suburbs. In fact, over the course of the 20th century, Ahmedabad, despite being at the, you know, the location of Mahatma Gandhi's ashram for nonviolence has actually been seen as riot prone. And Surat has actually been seen as an oasis of peace. So when I did my field work in Ahmedabad, um, I, I talked to a police official and he told me, well, you know, we saw, this, uh, we saw the riots in Gujarat this period. I, I went there uh, in 2006. Uh, we, we saw the riots in this period to be like unfinished business from the histories of, of Hindu-Muslim relations in the, sit, in the state. And once, you know, we thought we'd let the riots happen, and once they would happen, they'd never happen again. 
So that was his sentiment. I, I'm going to reinterpret what he meant. I, I do agree that this was about unfinished business, but I, I don't think for quite the kind of mechanisms or ideas that he had in mind. But we can hopefully come back to that later on. So what I'm going to talk about instead is how do historical co incentives that generated complementarities between ethnic groups, broadly speaking, you know, if one group was producing a right shoe and another group's producing, it's nice to have some, another group producing the left shoe. Um, how, how do things which create gains from trade between ethnic groups or economic competition between ethnic groups interact with political competition in shaping ethnic violence and electoral outcomes? So, I'm going to kind of, you know, I'm going to give you a few examples to, begin to kind of fix ideas. This little, little blob here is the Somnath Temple on the coast of Gujarat. It, it sort of got iconic status in India. So in, because in 1026, Mahmud of Ghazni, a famous Afghan uh, kind of raider, entered India. It was like one of the first sort of major kind of military interactions that um, you know, Hindus and Muslims had had in India. He sacked Somnath, which is a wealthy temple city, killed untold numbers of, my, of inhabitants, including apparently some of my ancestors, <laughs> clearly not all of my ancestors, but some. Um, and, and, and basically ever since then, from 1030 onwards, people have argued that this was a polarizing moment in Indian history and Muslims and Hindus have hated each other ever since. But I want you to look at these things over here. These are graves on the temple lands. Of course, Hindus don't have graves. They, we, you know, Hindus cremate their dead. These are actually Muslim traders' graves. Not very long after the sacking, actually, the rebuilt temple authorities invited Niruddin Firuz of Hormuz to settle in the temple lands because they knew that because Muslims dominated overseas trade in, this, in the Indian Ocean, for reasons I'm going to explain, bringing them and allowing them to settle in, in this area was really good for, it, for getting commercial taxation and building up that city. And in fact, the community that was created still exists today. And so despite being sort of this Kosovo polier place in Indian history, it's actually been a remarkably tolerant place nonetheless. In fact, this is not just a Somnath story. I'm sorry, it's kind of cut off. Um, another example is a, of a trading community that emerged in this time is the, the Borha trading community. The word Borha comes from the Gujarati word Vorvun, which literally means to trade. There were Hindus who converted to Islam in the Fatimid Caliphate, so there were Shia, when the Shias basically controlled Cairo and the Middle East. Um, they, they basically, they knew by becoming Shia, they could go on pilgrimage routes to, to Cairo and then later when the Shia Fatimids were kicked out to Yemen. And, and by doing so, they could basically tap the trade route. The pilgrim routes and the trade routes were very intri intrinsically linked in this period. And they were able to sort of become a major trading community. In fact, when the you know, Fatimids ultimately kicked out by Saladin, they end up in the, they, the center of their, uh, author, you know, they're basically their, institute, their organizational structure moves from Cairo to Yemen, ultimately to Gujarat itself. And this is where they're located today in Surat. In fact, they started off in Ahmedabad, but for reasons I'm going to describe, they actually had to flee there in a bit of a hurry. So they spent the, much of the rest of their time in medieval ports, so ultimately settling here, which is part, may, part of their main headquarters. Now part of, a lot of it's in Bombay as well. In fact, there are really, there are around, you know, those of you who are from East Africa will know the Bora trading community because they're, they're actually far, far, fairly widespread around the, around the world today. There's more than a million of them. They're highly organized in trade. Every Bora male child gets his name from the one guy, the, or the administration of one guy, the Dial Mutlak. So it's done by email now. So, you know, they email him, so, so what should I call him? Well, you know, call him, call him, you know. <laughs> the, the, um, I, I, I'll come up with a Bora name in a moment. <laughs> but but uh, they also get advice on how to, how, what kind of jobs to take. It's a very remarkably organized system. And I'll, I'll show you an example of what I mean just now. So this is Porbandar, which is another town in Gujarat. This is the old medieval community hall of the Bora trading community. They basically used to meet here. They were, like I mentioned, they're highly organized. Whenever there was a sort of a, a cyclone, or, which of course happens a fair amount in these areas, the Boras from other parts of the country would come and not only help their own kind of country, like Bora, fellow Boras, but also the local community in a way that seemed to mitigate local shocks. This is actually the modern Bora um, community center. I don't know if you read Gujarati, but they're right next to each other. You can see this historical continuity in the organization as it's passed over time. In contrast, this is Ahmedabad. And Ahmedabad basically, has, you know, it, it, its economy grew out of what was called the three threads, gold thread, gold thread weaving, silver thread weaving, and the other one, cotton thread weaving. Right? So 
th this was basically, Hindus and Muslims are basically competing in this industry. There were Hindu artisans, dads, and Muslim artisans who were basically in the same business. They would live side by side, but you can see that there were these gated communities within the old city Sikh precincts. You can imagine that these gates were closed at night, there were guards posted, and in fact, there was a fair amount of ethnic violence, which is why the Boras fled there um, back in 1657. So there's, you know, there's been this history of ethnic, of, of ethnic competition leading to violence in some parts of the country, and, and histories of ethnic complementarity or gains from trade leading to peace, I'm going to argue, in other parts of the country. Now, you might think that what I'm saying is pretty obvious. I mean, at least as early as Montesquieu, but actually going much further, people have argued, well, if you're trading with someone, you don't want to kind of kill them because that will, who are you going to trade with in the future, right? You lose the future stream of trade. But if you think about commercially oriented ethnic minorities around, there are numerous examples where, in fact, the ones who are kind of, who are often really big in trade are actually the targets of ethnic violence. You can think about the Chinese in Indonesia, the Indians in East Africa, but I'm sure you know many other examples as well. So what did the Muslims in medieval ports have going for them? Well, the first thing is they had this complementarity. And it was, a, it was an exogenous source of complementarity because for one month every year, for a 1,000 years, Mecca was the largest textile market in the world. You knew that if you went to Mecca for any part of the Muslim world, you would have a buyer for the goods you had to sell. And it was incredibly coordinated. As a Hindu, it's very hard to kind of replicate that kind of thing. I mean, the scale of the Hajj and the increasing returns to scale were such that this was, this was an exogenous and non-replicable source of complementarity. It was also a trading network, so it's hard to, it's, you know, it's intangible, so you can't seize it. So it's not like a machine or something that you could simply say, well, thanks, that's mine now. Um, the third thing that was also really important was that there was this non-violent way of transferring some of the gains from trade. So unlike in many Communities which have, which are like the Chinese, the Hokkien Chinese, for example, in Indonesia, where you basically were, it's a, it's a community which is very hard to enter, you know, and thus they had a lot of monopsony power. They basically controlled a lot of the trade of Indonesia. In print, you know, whenever the kind of relative value of goods that were coming from the Middle East rose, you could have you could have more immigration from other Muslims or conversion to Islam from Hindus in such a way which would allow to intra. Muslim competition, and which would kind of help share some of the, the benefits from that trade, you know, that exogenous trade increase to the Hindu community, to, to the local community. Furthermore, there is also this incentive for to create what, what I'm going to call complementary institutional mechanisms. I'm, to the kind of economist here, I'm kind of drawing on the theory of um, a, a Milgram Roberts style complementarity, right? So, there were cultural norms that were built to support this, this complementarity. For example, in India, there was this norm called kalapani, called black water. If you were a Hindu and you went across the black water, you'd basically lose your caste and you'd be sanctioned by other Hindus. So this actually went on until the early 20th century. So technically, I think I, I might have to do some purification rituals and I, if I go back. But you know, they, they don't do it so much anymore. But Gandhi had to do it. So, there are also organizations, as I mentioned, these, you know, these Bora organizations, but they're, they're, not, they're not the only ones. There's a large number of trading communities which emerged, not just in India, but across East Africa and elsewhere, which had similar properties. Um, there's also kind of this belief that if you went to a medieval trading port, you would, and, you, and a Muslim, you'd be welcomed. And this kind of helped kind of support larger Muslim communities than you might otherwise expect, given, given that they weren't under Muslim control politically. And in fact, if you look at sort of contemporaries who are Muslim writing on the southern coast of India, you know, basically this is take Zainuddin al-Malabari. He says, in the, in the southern Indian ports, the population became much increased. Thus there was sort of, and not, the buildings enlarged, suggesting that there's sort of gains from trade coming by means of the trade carried on by the Mohammedans, towards whom the chieftains of this place abstained from all oppression. And notwithstanding that they, you know, they were pagans, you know, and thus you, know, you can't rely on those guys, um, these rulers and troops, were all, uh, they, they paid much attention to their prejudices and customs and avoided any act of aggression to the Mohammedans. And this is all the more remarkable given that they were not only a tenth part of the population. So in the 16th century, it's fairly clear. And I think you know, other records suggest that there was this like, long history of religious and ethnic tolerance in South Asia between Hindus and Muslims in these medieval ports. So in a paper I, that's uh, now published, I basically showed that towns with a legacy of robust inter-ethnic complementarities due to Muslim-specific advantages in overseas trade showed lasting reductions in ethnic violence throughout the, from 1850 to 1995. Um, 
these towns also revealed household level, I used household level information to show that they, were, they had lower differences in group inequality. Muslims are allowed to become richer without, without, you know, without getting people to attack them, which is a nice sign that they're, they're allowed to kind of flourish at some level. Uh, there's a higher membership in inter-ethnic organizations, which kind of span ethnic lines. There's sustained ethnic specialization in trade. For example, the, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the Bohras today don't specialize in overseas trade to the Middle East so much, but they do do a lot of hardware. You know, they work on hardware um, much more and diamond weaving and such. Also, we can also look at sort of a behavioral measure of trust in the majority. So as you know, there's a meme in the Muslim world that if you have a polio vaccine, um, you're gonna get sterilized if you're a male child. And I, basically, I can show you that this is true in urban Muslim households in India, but in medieval ports, Muslims are as likely as Hindus to uh, vaccinate themselves against polio, which I think is a behavioral measure of trust um, in the community at large. The effects of environment for the, uh, of, the, of these effects on tolerance are actually greatest in environments where the state's incentives to protect religious minorities were the weakest. So if you imagine that local institutions are the kind I'm describing, are, can be are one way supporting tolerance, another way is just having the state support tolerance. Now, when the Muslims control the state, you don't need these local institutions to develop, and in fact, that's exactly what I find. But it's only places where there, were, there was less Muslim control that actually the effects of these local institutions is more important. It's also actually interestingly true in dem democratic India. In towns in, within states where Muslims were more likely to be pivotal in the state elections uh, at various times, and in, 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 in districts which were, had weaker economic conditions, those are precisely an environment where, which, where Muslims are more vulnerable, and medieval ports are actually, more, these local historical institutions are more likely to sustain um, peace in these environments. So in the newer paper, <laughs> um, I look at how this interacts with political competition. Now, in Westminster democracies, of course, um, you, you basically have a connection between local geography, local constituencies, and, who, and, and, and a member of parliament. It's not like a PR, so this is true in uh, India, it's true in most Commonwealth countries. It's not like a PR system where you get like proportional representation, um, which is unrelated to geography. I find that when you, historical interethnic complementarity, even in Gujarat, in that two month period that I was discussing, also reduces ethnic violence, consistent with my other paper, thankfully. Um, also, that this effect is magnified in close races. So when there are close local races, there's even less ethnic violence in these medieval port towns, and there's a swing against the incumbent party, which is seen as complicit in the violence. In contrast, in, in other places where there's historical economic competition, these areas which were once Muslim patronage cities, local races seem to increase ethnic violence, and also increase the swing to the, the incumbent, which is seen complicit in the violence. This is the fourth point is really a kind of a technical point for those who like regression discontinuity design. So you know, there's a kind of a literature which says that if you can use the randomness about being almost winning versus almost losing an election, you can basically identify the effects of winning an election on various types of outcomes. Now this has been challenged in the United States because people find that you can manipulate, oftentimes incumbents have a big advantage and, and thus it's not clear that it's random. However, other people said, well, in the rest of the world it's fine. What I'm, I'm gonna show you is that actually in these, even in these very close races, where historical incentives of like economic competition and complementarity are major drivers who's gonna win the, the next election. So in that sense, you, you, we, we might be looking at the wrong types of indicators to see whether there's you know, regression discontinuities are actually valid in this political context. Um, so this is just how, we, how I define a riot. It's going to be a, a conflict between two communally identified groups. This is the sense of newspaper reports and official records. For Gujarat, that can also code attempted violence, those you know, isolated stabbings that could have escalated into violence but did not. And this is based on court testimony as well as newspaper reports. A medieval trading port I'm going to define as one which had evidence of overseas trade prior to the 18th century and independent of Europeans. So this is not Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras, which the British basically set up. Um, this was done by looking at historical tra trading narratives and travelers' narratives all the way up to the contemporary period. Um, I also constructed a GIS, this, will, this is the theme of the conference, using uh, one of the first sentences of India, the Aini Akbari, which was done in the 1590s. And this allows me to kind of get a lot of information about the towns and the internal trade routes. Now, I'm going to argue it wasn't just trade per se that drove tolerance. Land trade routes actually don't show these effects, largely because if you're, you, know, you can replicate land trade routes locally. If you're a Muslim 
over here, Hindu over here, and you want to trade to the Middle East, you don't need to trade with a Muslim over here. You can trade with a Hindu over here and replicate locally land trade routes. It's only at the ports when you basically took a ship to Mecca and only Muslims are allowed to be in Mecca do you get this exogenous and, and robust complementarity. Um, you can also look at places which are medieval patient centers and medieval and where, where there's artisans. Now, many people have argued that human capital is a major driver of economic growth and development. Um, I'm going to show, I, I, I'm just, probably will show you, but not very much, that are in fact places which had historical artisanal crafts developing in the medieval period actually more likely to have violence. It's only when they were in medieval ports that these, are, these skills basically were coordinated in complementary ways and thus you had less violence. So human capital and institutions in that sense are complements rather than substitutes. Um, so this is kind of, this kind of shows you what the design is, very similar to what people have talked about already. You know, basically, I'm going to control for a number of initial geographic factors, which might also lead to you know, the selection of medieval ports. I'm also going to kind of compare towns along medieval era factors, which I like the ones I discussed. You know, you might think in India, caste is very important. A, a prox proximity to the Ganges is actually a very good exogenous determinant of caste because of India's sacred geography. There are more Brahmins and upper caste kind of closer to that. Um, I'm also going to kind of look at within native states, and I'm also going to use as a comparison modern overseas ports, which I'm going to show you do not have these relationships. There's only medieval ports. Um, so I'm just, this is what the Aini Akbari tells you about where these mint towns and patronage centers were. The deeper green shows you how long an area was under Muslim rule, which, as I mentioned, might be an important thing because the state basically has an incentive to protect the population. It also reflects what the religious demography looks like. So the, in these towns, the larger yellow shows you how, what proportion Muslims there are in a town, and the deeper green shows you what proportion Muslims are in the district. Now, I want you to, the, these triangles are where these medieval ports are. So I want you to keep that in mind as I show you where the violence is. So the red circles are basically the violence that happened between 1850 and 1950. You can see that even like very, you know, in medieval ports, despite having large Muslim populations, actually tend to have much less violence, even compared to towns very close by that were not medieval ports. Um, so you, know, you might think, well, medieval ports, maybe they're just lovely places. And you know, you just, you know, I, I, live in, I used to live in San Francisco. It's a lovely place. Maybe people just chilled you know, and, and don't want to kill each other. Right? So, uh, and you know, it, it's possible. Right? So, um, so one thing that you know, I, I did was I, I looked at, tried to, disc, tried to find what was an exogenous driver of medieval port location. Now, um, as David pointed out, natural harbors are a major driver of this. And I wanted to look at, this is a Portolan, which is a Portuguese navigator's map from the 16th century, showing that he was really worried about where these natural harbors were. Even more so than today, being in the natural harbor is really important if you had a, if you had a ship, because if you, if you weren't, you get hit by the cyclonic w winds and stuff like that. Madras um, is not at a natural harbor because East India Factor wanted to be close to his mistress. So, you know, so it still has problems with, but it has much less of a problem than it used to. Um, so one thing you can do is you can basically look at inlets from the sea and, and both the ones which kind of intersect the sea and the ones which are very close to the sea but did not intersect to get an idea of what medieval natural harbors might have looked like. I'm, I want to look at the medieval period because actually there's been a, the coast itself has moved, which we can use as a source of variation. So you can see that there, so for example, you can see that a lot of these medieval ports, these triangles are at places which had these little indentations, which made them protected from the sea. However, there are also places which are no longer accessible to shipping because of the amazing amount of monsoon rains that come into India. They kind of come down the mountains and push silt to the mouths of these rivers. So places which were once medieval natural harbors are no longer natural harbors. And you can use that to look at what you know, the, effect, the effect on medieval port location, which is in that not related to sort of just being a nice place to have a, nice place to have a harbor today. Um, so if you look at medieval port determines of medieval port location, um, lo looking at all those variables I talked about, being a medieval natural harbor is actually a major driver of it. It does not drive whether you're an overseas port a modern overseas port that wasn't a medieval natural harbor. So this is, again, consistent with the idea that this is not just you know, a great place for, to be, because it used to be, but it no longer is. Um, um, it, it, apart from that, I mean, that's actually the first order driver of, of medieval port location. And I'm going to use that for identification. If you look at the frequency of religious riots, medieval ports have around five times fewer riots than other very comparable towns even close by. Um, in contrast, as I mentioned, medieval inland trade routes do not have those properties. It's not trade, it's complementarity, as I argue. 
And places which had artisanal crafts are also more likely to have violence. And I don't show you the interaction, but this is when you interact that with medieval port, it goes the other way. And I'm going to skip this, but you know, as I mentioned, if you look at the places which are silted, they have similar effects. If you look at places, if you use the natural harbor as an instrument, you get very consistent effects. What, I'm not skipping it, am I? <laughs> if you look at uh, whether, if there was like, is there an, a port effect which isn't a medieval port effect? Actually, there isn't one. It's not that Bombay, Calcutta, or Madras, or other British established ports are more tolerant. In fact, they're not. And this is consistent with the idea that even when, at, when the Europeans came, basically, they disrupted Indi Indian Ocean trade routes to a large extent. So the, the Hindu-Muslim complementarity that existed in the medieval period did not really exist in, in these new areas because they were trading to England rather than to the Middle East. Now, this actually continues into the modern period. And, and this is sort of a Kaplan-Meier curve showing you the failure of religious tolerance in Indian towns. You can see you know, medieval ports actually did experience, many of them experienced violence ultimately, which is kind of tragic for India. Um, in some ways, that's actually good for me, though. Because what it shows you, at least at some level, they were at risk before. It wasn't that they couldn't have ever had violence. In fact, they did, ultimately. It just happened to be later. Um, so I'm just going to show you some of the household level information. What do these towns look like today? So these are, this is the distribution of wealth among Muslims and non-Muslims in non-medieval urban towns, non-medieval urban areas. And this is in medieval towns. You can see that there's a movement. Muslims basically become much more like Hindus in medieval ports, but they're much they're relatively poorer outside of medieval ports. Furthermore, they're highly specialized in occupations, exactly the ones that we were talking about. In medieval ports, around, despite being around 18% um, of the population, they're around 40% of the small traders in these towns, even today. And as I mentioned, there's these reinforcing organizations which allow them to re-specialize in new niches, often related to commerce, but not overseas commerce. Am I down to five? No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, um, this basically, I, I'm going to skip this, but you know, the other stuff I said is also true. <laughs> um, I, I want to go to Godra now and say, well, look, you know, that was looking at between 1850 and 1995. Let's look at this two-month period in a single state where there was a big state involvement in the violence, arguably. Now, this is kind of what I already said. Um, you know, that I, I, I argue that there's this com when you have the economic complementarity, really the local population doesn't want to sort of get rid of its minority population because there's gains from trade to be had. In fact, if a state government is complicit in violence, they won't be very supportive of that because they want to maintain their minority population. In contrast, if you have ethnic com competition, it might be the case that you actually have reinforcing violence because these guys want to take advantage of the fact that they have a complicit state government to sort of get rid of their economic competitors. And we see sort of a lot of anecdotal evidence from um, Hyderabad and other areas where this actually did happen. So um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about close races, as I mentioned. Um, close races really kind of enhance the incentives for campaign investment. So you know, you don't want to, you know, there's a re Obama only comes to California to raise money, but where he does his campaigning is Iowa, because that's where, you know, that, that's where the swing voters are. California is going to vote for him anyway. So you know, we're not going to see him. But my wife is from Iowa. She's met every president when she was in high school. Right? So, Similarly, so similarly, there's a one form of investment in developing countries is ethnic cleansing, unfortunately. In close races, one other way of getting rid of, of, of campaigning in close elections is getting rid of kind of people who don't vote for you. Often, because this is on ethnic lines, you get rid of other ethnicities. And I'm sure this is something that you've heard about or seen even yourselves. There, close races are determined by historical ethnic relations, clearly, and economic factors. But they may also have an exogenous component. So one of my colleagues, Neil Mohotra, has shown that when, you have, when your team, local team wins a, a victory in this local football game, you're more likely to re-elect the incumbent than if they'd lost, even if there's no relationship whatsoever with, uh, with, you know, with the, the success or performance of that incumbent. So what I'm going to do is take the distribution of close election races as given in, the, in 1998 and see what happens in places which were seen as close in 2002 during the violence, depending on whether it's ethnic complementarity or not. And you, basically, it's a similar exercise, except I have this vote margin variable. Are you within 5% in 1998? And the interactions between a medieval port and other types of Muslim patronage cities. I also look at the vote margin more generally in a continuous measure. Of course, these are going to go in a different direction. If you have a large vote margin, it means that you're less competitive. But you can see that 
Um, medieval ports, which, had, which, were, which were close, actually are even more or less likely to have violence, relatively speaking. Uh, these me medieval patronage towns are actually much more likely to have violence. Similarly, this is true in the continuous measure as well. Um, this, you, know, you, can, this, you can look at the extensive margin because the number of riots could be driven by outliers and you get very consistent results. Now, one thing that I noticed when I was doing my field work is that you know, people in Porbandar and these other towns said, you know, I, I asked some, some people, so why, why, why didn't it happen here when it's happening in much of the rest of the state? They said, well, actually people try to foment violence here. They send us bangles, which in the Indian context means that you're a woman because we weren't attacking our minority populations. And they said, but we didn't want it, our politicians didn't want it, our police didn't want it, so it didn't happen. But in many ways, you can look at whether there were, you know, the, you know, luckily or the kind of the, 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 the people perpetrating violence don't, didn't have access to the econometrics that I do now, so they couldn't really tell as much about this than I did. And if you look at whether there was any, any ethnic violence, including sort of isolated incidents, you see that medieval ports are as likely as other towns to have a, any kind of isolated stabbing or in, you know, kind of provocative act. It's it just that they didn't kind of expand into broader conflict, which I think is consistent with this idea that institutions and local organizations are keeping them in check. If, um, now, this is what looks like um, the Gujarat Assembly elections look like. So the pink is the Congress, and the saffron is the BJP. Um, you can see that before, in 1998, actually many of these um, little triangles, these medieval ports, are actually BJP supporters. But w after the violence, actually, you can see that they, they actually, many of them turned pink. The rest of the state is turning saffron at this time. So the BJP is getting a lot of electoral dividends from, from the ethnic violence that happened, but medieval ports are actually swimming against them. And you can see this sort of in the, in the ruling party vote share. Among other towns in 1998, there's a sort of a swing towards the BJP. You can see that there's like a mass which moves from here to here. In medieval ports, it actually goes over this way. And it can, in fact, it stays that way for some time to come. And medieval ports actually become more competitive in future elections. So I, you know, if I argue that you know, it was close elections which led to, in some ways, led to more violence in these, these patronage towns, and you think about what state government people will have in mind, they want to swing, the, they want to swing those close elections. But if the medieval ports are now the close election places, they will actually want to, you might actually see contagions of tolerance emerging because now they want to win the medieval ports rather than these sort of places which had you know, ethnic competition. So you could actually see that local politics are being magnified through the state dimension to a, a contagion of peace in, in some sense. Now, um, this is just kind of pointing out that co competitive elections do have this property I talked about. Now, what does happen in Gujarat after 2002 is that there's you know, medieval ports and other towns experience a massive drop in violence. And this persists for a longer period in time. I, I, this is suggestive. I don't know if it's, I, you know, I'm going to have to write another paper looking at you know, a broader set, a panel of, of, of other states and other kind of close elections to do this. But I think it does suggest that you could have a contagion of violence in places where local politics intersects with economic competition, but also potentially a contagion of peace when local politics interacts with, you know, institutions which come from history of ethnic tolerance. And I, I don't have time for my policy brief, but um, hopefully that, maybe I can swing that into the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, questions? We can give the students first dip as usual. And there is no dip to be given. There is the other. Um, I just want to hear about your policy brief. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me pay you later. Um, so I, I think what's interesting, well, is that the BJP basically does change its platform. I mean, the BJP basically, you know, when it, when it went into the next election and elections be, beyond, Narendra, Narendra Modi basically said, "I am no longer going to campaign on ethnic violence." And, it's, and in fact, in the recent elections, he did the same, and he won in Muslim majority districts in India as well. And I think the kind of the policy things that come out of this are two. There's from the economic side. If you homogen, you know, it's sort of this counterintuitive idea that if you homogenize human capital in a developing country context with, with these ethnic divisions, you might be benefiting in the long run, but in the short run, you might actually be kind of disrupting these complementarities which have maintained tolerance and peace for a long period of time. So this is something I think as a policymaker, it's good to be aware of. Um, one thing that the Aga Khan Foundation, you know, Hussein, another graduate of <laughs> Williams, but, um, 
well, it, there's a, it, it, you know, they, they're another community which comes out of the Indian trading um, side of things, but they're active throughout most of the Muslim world. They created this thing called industrial promotion services, where they match Boras, uh, sorry, they match uh, Ismailis and non-Ismailis by complementary kind of business activities to create this sort of incubator for which, uh, which spans ethnic lines. And you know, if you go to East Africa, you know, as, as a South Asian, you know, there's a bit of tension, of, of course. I mean, there's Goldenberg and you know, all these other scandals that have been around, but. You know, people from the Ismaili community are considered to be different than other South Asians, I think largely because of this mechanism. Now, on the political side, I think it's just good to be aware that in Westminster democracies, politics magnifies local, in, local incent, interests in a big way. So we can predict where those are going to be. Of course, you know, political overlords have other incentives, but you know, as, as sort of people in charge, it's good to be aware of where these kind of threat points might emerge and think about ways to kind of mitigate them locally. I think that would be what I would say. Thank you. That's a good so for this effect of the interaction of economic competition and close races leading to violence, it seems like you interpret that as being high political returns to ethnic conflict, which is certainly possible. But we also believe there are other things different about politics in the political rights areas. So I'm thinking of, for example, Berge and Candy's model that candidate quality might be lower or voter monitoring of candidate might be lower. Mm -hmm. So do you think these are relevant channels or is there any evidence that allows you to put the light on them? So candidate in this context? Yeah, sorry. All right, so the question is largely are there other channels which, sorry, <laughs> could you repeat the question first? <laughs> Than this high political returns to violence that can explain this interaction between uh, ethnic competition and close races. I'm thinking particularly of things like candidate quality or voter monitoring effort, which have mm -hmm. kind of been highlighted in other models. So, so I think in this context, um, you know. It's not clear to me that voter monitoring was any different in these various places, and it would have to be the case that they basically, you know, were, were monitoring these medieval ports much more than other. I didn't I didn't rephrase the question. But they, they, they much more than they they had other places, and that's not clear to me to be the case. It could be the case, if it, you know, but you know, ex ante, I, I, my prior is that they didn't do that. Um, candidate quality is of course hard to measure. Um, there's no obvious, um, obvious uh, distinctions between these candidates. Um, again, what, the way people identify the effects of election success or failure, as you know, is through these RD designs. And they might actually influence candidate quality ex post. You might get very different candidates in these places where, where the BJP basically won because they had, you know, <laughs> because they'd taken advantage of the violence versus places where they, uh, where they were pushed out because of the violence. But that's something that actually is worth, definitely worth exploring more of um, in future research. So yes. Just a question on, on heterogeneity. So it seems like complementarity might lead to strong incentives to expropriate. And you, you kind of make clear that, that one thing that's crucial historically is that the Muslim couldn't be expropriated from a monopoly. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine that in a lot of settings, yeah. a monopolist minority could be expropriated. Absolutely. Yes. So, so do, you have, do you have other examples in mind of where you have like an ethnic group sort of monopoly or, or over a particular production process? Where, where this is kind of relevant in the modern world. In the modern world? Yeah, let's, yeah. Just, just in terms of like, so, so mm -hmm. the, the one, the, the policy prescription of, of sort of saying like differentiation could be good, uh, but in a world where, you know, let's say competition is, is you know, sort of so, fiercer yeah, so, globally, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. then it might be less common today that, that these complementaries are good. But I'm just, I'm, I was trying to think of some other. So, so I have a, I actually have a very promising graduate student who's, you know, <laughs> who's, who's actually looked at sort of uh, systematically across, the, across countries at minorities at risk and tried to classify them according to the presence of economic complementarity. And he's found that there's actually been systematic de dis, um, decreases in ethnic violence against those groups, holding constant some of the kind of usual factors you might think. So I do think that there are, you know, I mean, we, we could talk about examples later, but I, I sort of, on average, it does seem to be the case that this, this mechanism is playing out elsewhere as well. Like, should, we be, should, we be, should we be worried that existing complementarities, because competition is, is you know, easier to, to generate across mm -hmm. groups in mm -hmm. the modern world, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, are the, like, one, one potential policy angle on this is, you know, these are actually places that, that we might worry about. Like yes, places that's where right. Where there are, you know, minor.
So I, I'm not advocating sort of keeping people sort of in these ethnic niches. I mean, in the short term, that might create peace, but in the long term, it might create a lot of misallocation of capital. What I am suggesting is we be aware that the, you know, by homogenizing human capital, we can lead to sort of ethnic violence in a way that you might, you know, it, it seems a bit counterintuitive when you think about. I mean, I think one interesting thing about Europe in the 19th century is the mass literacy campaigns do seem to be tied or seem to be somewhat related to pogroms that emerge against ethnic minorities as well. So it's sort of a, I think, a dark side of modernization at some level. We have a minute left. I'm not sure for the question. So I guess I don't, I don't quite understand why in a non-medieval fourth town, when Hindus and Muslims are living together, maybe in competitive trades, why those Muslims aren't part of, they must be part of a Bora Muslim network, the Muslims in the legal court towns. Mm -hmm. And that seems like enough of a trading advantage to protect them, even in inland towns, I yes. guess. So your identification so, depends on this. So, so. So these are sort of, you know, unfortunately, I have very crude measures. I just have a classification that says Muslim. I don't have, you know, in, in these inland towns. I can do a bit better in Gujarat. But, um, but the general Muslim in these towns will not be from these trading communities. They will be people who have converted largely for, you know, to, um, either they, you know, they immigrated into the area or they converted for other reasons. In fact, largely to tap the patronage network. So, you know, when, when the, like in Delhi, for example, this is something I learned for, for Roger's class. <laughs> when, when the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb went south to campaign in the Deccan, he took three quarters of the population of the city with him. And this is a city of 400,000 people at the time. And this is not because they work directly for him, but they work for people who work for people who work for people who work for him. And so Muslims had an advantage in tapping those patronage networks in other Indian towns. In medieval ports, the relationships were much more horizontal, arguably. And thus, you had to kind of build up support for trade rather than you know, I, I'm making this thing for the, you know, the big guy kind of, kind of dynamic. Does that make sense? So I think we should be we're exactly on time. I, I have like two questions that took quite time, but I'll suppress them. Now, <laughs> we should stop now. Uh, we have um, a break now. We'll resume again at 1.30. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.